Hide Your Ports. At its core, uh, Hide Your Ports is an implementation of port knocking. And port knocking is a method of concealing ports where by default they're closed and they don't show up in a port scan. Uh, the, the name port knocking actually comes from secret door knocks. Like when you knock on a door, only people that know the secret knock are the ones that are let in. Um, so port knocking is kind of similar to that. But instead of knocking on a door, you're transmitting a specific pattern of messages. And when the, the firewall sees those messages, that specific pattern it's looking for, it then can perform an action, uh, such as you know changing the firewall rules to let that person in. So that, that pattern of traffic is known as the authentic knock sequence. And there's many ways that that can be uh, determined, like what, what, what the pattern is. So there, there's uh, different ways it could be implemented, but the, mo the most common way is to use the transport layer headers. Things like, you know, what TCP port or UDP port is this traffic supposed to be destined to? Um, so as an example, you know, you could have a program that watches every incoming packet on, on the firewall and it, it looks for connections on port uh, 1234, uh, th 31483, um, 54325. I'm just throwing random numbers out here, but you know, a specific pattern, uh, whatever it might be. And once it sees that pattern, then it can perform you know, the action of letting that source IP address in to access the service. One of the problems with port knocking on its own though is that it's susceptible to replay attacks so if you have a rogue network operator or a man in the middle that's uh, wiretapping your traffic they, they're seeing what you're sending uh, then that entity would be able to you know transmit the same datagrams the authentic knock sequence datagrams and and replay those um, and that would allow them to get access to the system um, from wherever they are so you know, replay attacks, uh, you know, if you're being, you know, ultra cautious, it could be something you're, you're, you're concerned about. So pr to protect against that, you need some way to rotate or change the knock sequence after it's been used. So each knock sequence can only be used one time and that's it. So in, in the physical example of like a secret door knock, you know, the, the logistics of changing the secret door knock every single time it's used, that's, that's quite complex for people. But Luckily, computers are not people and can do cryptography very quickly. So the problem is then, uh, how, how do the client and server know what the current authentic knock sequence is? They, they need to be in sync whenever it changes. Um, luckily, we already have this great standard called uh, TOTP, which is described in RFC 6238. Uh, TOTP is basically the authenticator apps that you would use on your phone when you're logging into a website. Um, you know, Microsoft Authenticator, Google Authenticator, Okta, uh, Duo. Um, these are all examples of TOTP. They generate one-time passwords that change every 30 seconds. And this standard can be ad adapted to hide your ports use case, which is to change the knock sequence. So let's say you have this scenario where you have a, a trusted user uh, connecting in from an untrusted network, such as the internet. So let's say they're at a Starbucks cafe on the public Wi-Fi. They're trying to get to some internal services that you may have, um, such as SSH or a VPN client uh, or a web service or whatever it is. Um, but the firewall is blocking them because it only uh, allows connections uh, from, from trusted sources. So they get blocked. Well, one thing you could do um, to allow this situation is to have a fully open uh, firewall, which allows the user to get to their stuff. Uh, they can connect in from anywhere. So they, if they have their VPN client, let's say, um, they'd be able to connect in from anywhere on the internet to get to connect to it. The problem you might have with that, though, is that um, any, any threat actors that might be out there on the internet can also connect to these services. So if you have someone... Uh, like famous hacker Gia Tan here, trying to connect to your SSH daemon, he's going to be able to. You know, there, there's recently been that hack with XZ where uh, a key was inserted into a library which links to SSH and uh, apparently allows them to bypass all authentication. So that's not a good situation. Um, something similar could happen with uh, any other type of service as well. So you never know. So it's best not to have a fully open uh, network. The other thing is that uh, other hackers um, from, let's say, other, other countries, uh, let's say Russia or China or even uh, America, 
um, they, they could be doing port scans and determine which services are open on the internet. Um, so they can easily do a port scan and they can see, oh, you know, you're running SSH, you have a web service, you have a VPN service uh, that's open on the internet. Now, there may be some authentication mechanism on those services, which don't just allow anyone to connect through and, um, and, and basically get into the system. Like you'll still have to log in with your SSH key or maybe your VPN, you might have a username and password or a certificate. Um, so that's good, but th the point is, is that vulnerabilities can exist in these services as well. So um, let's say you have a, just any hacker, it doesn't have to be from Russia, I just, I just say that because that's, that's kind of the meme. There's a lot of port scans I, I see, at least on my personal stuff, coming from uh, Russia in particular and China and others. So, um, But yeah, it could be anyone. And so that's not good, especially if there is a vulnerability in those services. The, uh, the scenario that Hydra Ports is trying to prevent is that exact scenario. So you can have a normally closed firewall where the trusted user can't get to their stuff. But what Hide Your Ports does is there's a little daemon that's running on this firewall. It's running Hide Your Ports. And the trusted user also has the client for Hide Your Ports. And when they run the client for Hide Your Ports, it's going to do a series of connections, not, not connections, but it's going to send a series of datagrams uh, from from the trusted computer to the the external firewall and it's basically going to be from the outside it's going to look like a random pattern of just traffic being sent here on, on various ports um, but the daemon on the external firewall is watching for that pattern and once it sees that pattern it will then allow the trusted user to connect into the service uh, that they want to while still remaining closed to you know everyone else that might be out there on the internet such as our famous hacker here. Uh, now, the way that this works, I'll go into a bit more detail here, but there's a trusted client and the external firewall, just as we saw in the other diagrams, both of those have a pre-shared key. The, the key is generated by the server and then distributed to the client. So they both have the same key um, and they both have the same time. So as long as they're within 30 seconds of, of one another, so it's still recommended that you synchronize time with NTP, you know, synchronize your, your watches, so to speak, uh, make sure that you meet at the same time. That, that's really important because the time is part of the calculation. Uh, so the pre-shared key and the time are both ran through a SHA-1 HMAC on both sides. That's how they know uh, what pattern to look for and it's gonna produce 160 bits of output um, on both sides. So it's the same 160 bits on both sides. Uh, the trusted client and the external firewall both have the same. That 160 bits then runs through a reduction algorithm to reduce it down to 64 bits because that's actually the size that we need. And that 64 bits is then divided into four 16-bit integers. Now, a 16-bit integer can represent, uh, when it's an unsigned integer, it can represent a number between 0 and 65,535. That's basically representing a port number because that's the same range as what a UDP port number is. It's, it's represented by a 16-bit integer. Um, so we get four of those, which gives us, you know, just in this example, it gave us these numbers here, 40651, 2643. 9564 and 61134. Both sides have the same numbers because they have the same key and the same time within 30 seconds, like I said. Uh, there, there is support for clock skew up to 30 seconds, so they don't have to be exactly the same, but uh, uh, they, they should be relatively close. So what happens is when the trusted client runs the hide your ports client, uh, they're going to connect to the firewall on those ports one after another. Now this is important, it, it's that it's done in the correct order. So these are, uh, each of these transmissions are spaced out a little bit, uh, uh, 500 milliseconds by default. Although that, that is tunable, if you have a, a high bandwidth network uh, that might have multiple paths, you want them to arrive in the correct order. Um, so so you, you can tune the, the delay between each of these transmissions. And once the firewall sees that the correct pattern has been matched, it then it permits access to whatever service you want. Right now, in this example, it's showing TCP port 22, which is an SSH service.
So now I'll give a quick demo of how to install HydroPorts and how to set it up and, and uh, actually get using it. So you can download it from deadbeef.coats slash Steven slash HYP and get the URL right here. Um, and I'll just explain my demo here. So on the left, I have what will be the HydroPorts client. I just have two terminal windows open here. And on the right, I have a uh, valuable server. So this is the server that's maybe hosting your SSH daemon uh, that you want to get into. It's also going to be the HydroPort server in this case, uh, just because I don't have another firewall, another box that I could run this on. Um, so first step is to uh, just clone the, the repo. So you can just use git clone. Uh, I already have it here. So I'm just gonna clean it up just so that way have a clean copy so you'd get clone and same over here now the only uh, requirement is that uh, if you want to build it yourself you need go installed golang.org is where you can get that if you want you can also download the pre-compiled binaries from the releases page I have uh, compiled them for Linux and Windows just for x64 but with uh, go you could compile this onto arm or uh, any other architecture that go supports there's quite a few um, if you wanted to do that, but in this case, um, uh, in this case, we're just going to uh, build it here locally. Um, so if this is going to be the server, I'm going to go into the server directory and type go build. That's going to produce one artifact, uh, HYPD. And on this side, I'm going to go into there as well, and I'm going to go into the client directory and also go build. Uh, I should mention also to build the server, you need libpcap devil installed. So if you're running Debian, you can just install libpcap uh, dev. Uh, that's the package name there. I already have it installed. If, uh, if you don't have it installed and you try to build or run, uh, you're going to run into some problems because it uses libpcap to watch the incoming traffic. And on the client side, uh, after the build is done, you'll get this HYP client uh, artifact. Now, the first uh, thing to note here is that uh, if we look at IP tables, I just have to type in my sudo password here. We have a uh, input chain here with a policy of accept. So if I were to try to SSH to this server, let me just get the IP address quick. It's uh, 10.6969113, uh, okay, that's interesting. Uh, we can connect. So this is the fully open scenario right here. So what we need to do is uh, make this uh, IP, we need to make this normally closed. Hold on a sec here. This is the default policy. So we changed the default policy of the input chain to drop. You can see we're still connected here because we got this uh, CT related established is accepted. But if I were to disconnect and then try to reconnect, it's not gonna work because uh, the default policy is drop. So at this point, um, we can start running Hydra ports. Uh, first of all though, we have to if you just run it by default, you can see some example usage. The first thing we need to do is generate the secret though. Uh, generate secret. And this is going to create a file called hyp.secret. And if you wanted to look at it, you can just use cat. This is the secret here. This, this secret needs to be distributed uh, to the client as well. So all you need to do is create a, a file here with the same name and the same contents. Uh, after that's done, you can then run the Hydra ports in server mode and it needs a device. Uh, it needs the network device here. So we're gonna take this ENP0S3. Oops, let me just put a space there. Uh, and of course you need, uh, you need privileges to capture with the adapter. I'm gonna use root in this case, although you could probably make a user account. Um, and assign it the privileges you need. So it's gonna generate a couple sequences right off the bat. This is 30 seconds in the past. This is the current sequence. This is 30 seconds in the future. You'll notice that the 30 seconds in the future moves to the current sequence spot after 30 seconds and a new one is generated here. This one here, move down here. And then it, this one gets timed out. This one will be timed out in a few seconds here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the other things I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna open up a second uh, terminal here. 
Uh, I'm going to, as root, we're going to watch the IP tables because when HydroPorts detects uh, the correct sequence, we'll see that it will insert a rule here. And on the client side, we're just going to run the HydroPorts client and we're going to specify the IP address that we want to connect to. So we're going to do that. It's going to transmit the same knock sequences. You see it selected 8960-5120-4074 and 49408. That's this one down here. So it actually got the right one. And the other interesting thing is that it, um, it did add in a new rule here to destination port SSH. So if I try to SSH to it again, it's going to let me connect. And I'm into valuable server. Um, if I try to SSH from, let's say, this computer here, which is my desktop, not not Spud, it's a different computer here, um, it's not going to work either. So this is the, the threat actor perspective, basically. Um, the other thing is, is that um, it won't show up in a port scan. So if I try to nmap uh, t4av 1069 uh, from here, it's not going to show anything. It seems that the host is down. Uh, 